Imagine yourself speeding down a mountain, going 50 miles an hour, jumping gaps longer than school buses, while riding a bike all worth more than your car. This is downhill mountain biking, but it hasn't always been like this. From its humble beginnings almost 40 years ago, it has evolved into, a, an, into an amazing sport. And that evolution is what I would like to discuss today. Mountain biking has been a passion of mine for many years. On a day that's not too hot, you'll often see me riding to school or carrying my helmet with me. It's just a passion of mine. The advances in mountain biking also affect the mainstream market. The products and components that you have on your bike at home have probably been affected by the evolution of mountain biking. But for us to truly understand the evolution, though, we have to look at the beginning. The first organized downhill mountain biking event was held in 1976 on a fire road in Fairfax, California, known as Repack Road. The bikes used were called plunkers, and the course was a well-maintained fire road. It allowed riders to go fast and not focus on anything technical. The evolution of downhill mountain biking can mainly be seen in those two ways, the bikes and the courses. The evolution of downhill mountain biking is not something, the evolution of downhill mountain biking courses is not something that's closely examined often. Both in the explosion in the number of courses and in the differences, differences between the original and the more modern courses, it's easy to see how they've evolved. Courses today feature obstacles that require precise movement and planning to get through. And, they've, and there's an, ins, an explosion in the number of courses. California alone has over 5,000 miles of mountain biking trails. Now every year, nine tracks are selected from around the world for the Union Cycliste Internationale Downhill Mountain Biking World Championship, UCI World Cup for short. And they all differ greatly. However, most of the courses share one thing in common, that's that they all require a great deal of skill to get down. Now Repack Road. It was 2.1 miles long with an elevation loss of 1,300 feet. On average, this means it has an 11% grade. That's an 11% grade right there. Modern courses are much different. The 2015 UCI Downhill World Championship was held in Val Nord, Andorra. Andorra is a country just on the border of Spain and France. The course there was one and a half miles long with an elevation loss of 2,300 feet. This is an average grade of 29%. So you can see that there's quite the difference there. This course in Andorra and most other modern courses also feature other obstacles such as rock gardens in the top left, uh, bridges, routes, or jumps. Now since 1990, since 1990, the championships of the Mountain Biking World Cup have been held in 15 different countries. And this is only showing the championships of every year. If you include the countries visited in qualifying matches, the number jumps to 21. But then again, this is only the professional grade courses. If you include all the hobbyist courses found around Fullerton or the rides that you and I could go on, the number jumps drastically to 72. Now in just 40 years, downhill mountain biking has evolved into something great, going from one course in Northern California to thousands of courses across over 70 countries. Now probably the most visual evolution of the mountain biking is the evolution of the mountain bikes themselves. The downhill mountain bikes today can cost over $10,000. The bikes of this grade are incredibly sophisticated and super light. But how bikes became what they are today is what we're really interested in. Bikes have really evolved in three time periods. The original bikes used on Repack Road, the evolution from Repack Road to the early 2000s, and from 2000s to what they are today. Bikes ridden by the original few on Repack Road were modified Schwinn Excelsior bikes. Schwinn Excelsiors were produced in the 1940s at the height of the Great Depression. At, in the early 1970s, the going rate for a Schwinn Excelsior was $5, and they were perfect for bombing down hills. They have many nicknames, including paperboy bikes, cruisers, bombers, and of course clunkers, the one that stuck. Now, clunkers originally had coaster brakes, brakes that were activated by you pedaling backwards and it would lock up the rear tire completely, so you, you would send your bike into a drift down the hill. Coaster brakes would generate so much heat that at the bottom of the hill, all the grease inside the brake would have evaporated, and you would have to repack the brake with grease. Thus the term repack road was coined. 
1974 about some of the first real modifications to the clunkers. This is, an, this is a clunker here. It features updated drum brakes as well as, an, uh, as well as a seal reinforcement to the front stem. Quickly following in 1975 was the addition of shiftable gears in the front and rear, changing it to a 21 speed bike. And finally in 1979, when a few of the original friends on Repack Road began producing their own bikes, that was the largest evolution. You see a big difference in the frames and the tires here between the last cruiser and the more modern mountain bikes. Now between here and the year 2000, downhill mountain biking gained an incredible popularity. People and companies began producing bikes specifically for going downhill. And some of the inventions created before 2000 were the rim brakes and most notably the front suspension. Rim brakes were a new type of brake the ladder rider is much quicker and smoother and more effective braking. Rim brakes use rubber brake pads to push against the outside rim. In addition, front suspension also was created, which allowed riders to uh, uh, allowed riders to go over bumps in the road much faster without losing forward momentum and being launched skyward. Front suspension made riding bikes much safer and more and it allowed people to be more aggressive in the act. Now from 2000 to today, uh, evolution of mountain bike has, been, has, been, uh, has come to a precise science, and two of the main innovations include the disc brake and the rear suspension. Disc brakes were a further innovation on the uh, rim brakes. However, they used a disc in the middle, which more effectively and reliably uh, braked the bike down because it could dissipate heat faster and had less room for air. Rear suspension also worked the same way as front suspension. It absorbed upward momentum and translated it into forward momentum. This changed the game of mountain biking so much that it is now required in all downhill mountain biking competitions, just because it's so much safer and it allowed for, such more, for much more greater speed of riders. Over the past 40 years, the mountain bike has evolved exceedingly quick, much faster than any other form of bicycle. The evolution of the bike itself is a driving force in the evolution the sport as a whole. Now, downhill mountain biking has come a long way since its founding in 1974 by a few friends looking for an adrenaline rush. From one course to thousands, from a little hill to a steep mountain, and a $5 bike to a $10,000 bike, the evolution is incredible. The next time you see an event on TV or someone riding their bike to school, I hope you remember where it all started and, of course, how it got to where it is today. Thank you. So Taylor, what did you think? I thought the topic was really interesting. I really liked it, and I was, I liked your presentation of how, like, just how you delivered it. It was easy to listen to, and I liked just the information you gave us. Um, I didn't hear any of the source citations, however. I didn't hear any of those. Um, but I also liked your visuals. I think they helped us to like understand what you're talking about. And, it was easy to 
Yeah, Cooper, I thought that the attention device and the topic was nicely identified. You had a very clear statement of your purpose. I thought you created a pretty good justification for people who might have some passing interest in it just simply because they're bicyclists and, or enthusiasts uh, and uh, the influence that these kinds of races and the mountain bikes have on other kinds of things then gives us an extra reason to listen. I did not hear a preview in the speech, and although the topic, it, or excuse me, although the material is organized topically, it feels a little bit random sometimes in that uh, in those categories. As I look and listen to the speech, I, I can hear historical information in several different places, and then there is the identification of the organization, and then there's the evolution of the bikes. So it's not clear if we are looking at. Uh, separate elements as they evolve or if we're looking at all of them evolving at the same time and I think that would have been a little bit clearer. On the other hand, I thought you did a very good job internally kind of summarizing each point and telling us where we were. So even though uh, the basic structure I think is a little bit problematic, uh, the labels and the transitions were very clear when you are uh, presenting that information. I'm going to have to agree with Taylor. I didn't hear any reference work in your material and that's I think a little bit problematic, but I did think that your personal enthusiasm was solid. And I think the delivery is uh, is okay for a presentation that has to be predominantly read. I do think that that is a little bit of a problem because it takes you away from the audience uh, a little more f frequently than you would want. All right, thank you. Really.